Okay, the recording also started. So welcome to the 33rd session of the Bhagavad Gita with technology interludes for ages eight and up. In the last session, we covered, um, let's see what we covered. We covered, a, we are in the fifth chapter and I think last session we covered this one. Vidya Vinaya Sampanne Brahmane Gavihastini Sunichai Vascha Pakecha Pandita Samadarshinaha. That was the 18th sloka from the fifth chapter. And we saw how. Someone who is. Like, yeah. So the wise. Right. The wise see everybody as equal, whether it be a Brahmana a cow or an elephant or a dog or a dog eater as well. So that's what we covered last time. And we also covered how various Bhagavad Gita slokas um, come to our aid in difficult situation. So, uh, uh, for instance, for uh, when we are angry, um, there are uh, slokas in chapter two, chapter five and chapter 16, which help us control the anger. When we are confused, there are some slokas and so on and so forth. You can solve all of your problems in the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. What happened to this? There was a technical issue. Okay, so we, we covered uh, that and today we are going to look at a new sloka. This is the 23rd sloka from the fifth chapter. It reads like this. Shaknoti haiva yasodhum rak sharir vimokshanat kama krodod bhavam vegam Sayukta Sasuki Naraha. We already know um, a lot of these words. Well, some of them. Yeah, some of them the words. I mean, by now, we, we are already in the 33rd session of Bhagavad Gita, and we had five sessions of other, uh, other topics also in Sanskrit. So you should be pretty comfortable with a lot of Sanskrit by now. So once again, in, in uh, English, Shakno Te Haiva Yasodhum. Prak Sharir Vimokshanat Kama Krodod Bhavam Megam Sayuktasa Sukhi Naraha. So Shaknoti Shakti. Shakti is like strength. Yeah, strength. So Shaknoti is being able to do something. Iha means this. Eva means uh, in this kind of thing. So in the present body, roughly it translates to in the present body, in the present, not even body. So there was like right now? Yeah, right now, iha eva, in the present. Yaha means one who, right? Sodhum means to tolerate. Prak, prachina, pra means before. Prachina means ancient. So pra, prak means before. Sharira. Body. It's body. It's an Indian word, Indian language word. Um, vimokshanat. Moksha, you know, V is like supporting it. So moksha, vimokshanat means giving up. So moksha, vimokshanat is kind of like yagi. Yeah, vimokshanat. Meaning, meaning. Yeah, giving up. Yeah, moksha, you know, right? Moksha yeah. is nirvana, attaining, attaining nirvana, attaining the God. So vimokshanat means uh, um, in this case, uh, it is attaining God, but then when do you attain God? Only when you give up the uh, present body, right? So uh, vimokshanat in this sloka kind of giving you the sense that you are giving up the current body. Vimokshanat is a double negative, right? Because V means not and not means not. So No, not remember not. V can also mean aiding, supporting, right? So it's not always neg negation. 
So a B and V, they can be uh, supporting, they can be used in a supporting sense also. So in this case, it is like supporting. So vimokshana, kama is desire. Yeah, attachment, desire. Krodha is anger. Udbhavam, bhavam means to be. Uh, ud bhavam means ud means uh, to rise so ud bhavam means uh, to rise from or to generate it from vegam vegam means speed right uh, speed and urge and the force basically force vegam is force uh, urge in this case in the, in the in this context it means urge because urge and force, they're somewhat like similar. Saha means, yaha means one who, saha means he. Yukta means uh, in moderation, in, uh, in, yeah, in moderation kind of thing. Again, saha means he. Sukhi, sukha means happiness. Nara means human being. In, in Mahabharata, Arjuna is considered as a Nara and Krishna is considered as a Narayana. So Nara Nara. Oh, yeah. yeah, so Nara means a human being. So the meaning is one who before leaving his body learns to give up or go beyond the promptings of desire and anger. That means he is able to control desire and anger. He is a saint and is always happy. That's what it means. Right? So we are given this body and we will give up the body, assuming that we are the soul and not the body. So we'll give up that body. And before we give up that body, before uh, body is like a tool, right? Body is like a tool. So before giving up the to uh, tool, you make use of the, make the best use of the tool, right? Then yeah. what is the best use of the tool? To, use it for good. yeah, use it for good and to give up attachments. One of the, two of the most important side effects or the effects of attachment are desire and anger, right? So Lord Krishna is saying that before you give up the tool, Make the best use of it. Try to give up desire and anger. Because desire and anger, they become powerful if not controlled early. Right? Uh, so you, you, you experience yourself, right? The longer you wait for your desire to be fulfilled, the stronger it becomes, right? You want to eat a cake. And the cake, you, your thought is all on cake. And the longer the, that cake is uh, delayed from being delivered to your home, the stronger will become your urge. Right? You will be more and more longing for the cake. Right? Same thing with anger. The more uh, you express your anger, the more angry you will get. Suppose the other person is just uh, not... Uh, not saying anything and you're shouting at that person in anger. If, the, if you, the other person is not able to control you and you are also not able to control yourself, then the anger can go extreme. Right? It becomes, it only increases. So same thing, if you don't control desire and anger in this life, it will become increased. It will come back in the next life in increased doses. So it's like a habit that keeps getting stronger. Yeah, and stronger, exactly. Harder. You get addicted to it, kind of. It's more like a habit and it, it's like an addiction. So if it goes that far, then it can be hard to confront them, right? Um, so um, sometimes, uh, see, these feelings are basic instincts. Anger, desire, they are all basic instincts. That means they're like animal instincts. So you think of them as animals. So uh, suppose uh, there's a dog. Uh, you don't like the dog. You shout at it. What does the dog do? It either shouts back at you or runs away. 
it shouts back. Mostly it will shout back. It will bark. So if you shout at it, it will bark back. And if you try to hit it, it will try to bite you. Right? Same thing with the snake. You try to hit it or something, it will bite. So that is the reason why in India, when there is a snake, many people pray to the snake. They say, oh, snake god, please go away. Please do not hurt us, that kind of thing. Uh, same with dogs. Um, uh, they are the nature of these animals and the basic instincts in us. And we are basically, we, are, we have grown from being animals, right? The evolution theory of Darwin, Darwin's theory of evolution or even our own dashavataras tell you the theory of evolution, right? So um, we were fish before, and then from fish, we became turtle, turtle and so on and so forth. Uh, turtle stays in the water and in the land, right? So first it was water, then water and land, and then part lion and part human being. So all those things happen, Narasimha. Um, so we, so we still have that basic instinct. The basic instincts are still from the animal instincts. So when you deal with basic instincts, you should deal with them as if they are animals. So if you if you counter them wildly, they'll come back more wildly, right? If you come gently, then yeah, you need to kind of uh, be gentle with them slowly get rid of them, right? Otherwise they, they can fight back, they can come back with a lot of force. So you should somehow uh, be very gentle and uh, it's like self-hypnosis. You should self-hypnotize yourself. Uh, later in one of the slokas, Lord Krishna gives you an algorithm, a recipe to do that. He says there are two ways. Because he tells you many ways, um, but in that particular slokas, sloka, he says, um, one way is to uh, develop a uh, detachment. Uh, so you just say, so what? Keep saying, so. cake is coming. It is taking a lot of time. So what? I'm not interested in cake. I'm not, uh, I'm beyond cake. I'm not a small child to uh, uh, be longing for a cake. So somehow develop that kind of a detachment. So that is one, that is uh, vairagya, that is called vairagya. And the other is abhyasa. Abhyasa is practice. Even in English, they say practice maketh the uh, man perfect, right? So abhyasa and vairagya, these are two primary tools. And in the next sloka, in the next month's sloka that we are going to cover, we, we will, Lord Krishna gives you an algorithm for meditation also, how to meditate. So we'll cover that in the next month's sloka. So those are some other ways, but never show force on it. So if you say, uh, I am not going to like the cake. I'm not going to like the cake. I'm not going to like the cake. Then you're, desire for the cake becomes even stronger. Because you're still thinking about yeah, it? Yeah, because you're still thinking about it. And because the nature, the basic instinct is like an animal instinct. The more, whatever you give it to it, it comes back with greater effect. Just like a dog barks with more when you shout at it. It's kind of like a rubber band. The more you push it back, the more forcefully it will spring forward. Yeah, but rubber band kind springs forward. Yeah, yeah, you can think of it like that also. So be gentle with it. And that is the reason why meditation, abhyasa, vairagya, these are all soft tools, right? So, uh, so use some soft tools, very soft, be very gentle uh, with these bad things also because they're animal instincts. So what is the root cause of anger and desire? It is attachment, thinking that you are the body, the body is you and not the soul, right? So if you think that you are the body, then you will suffer more actually, right? Um, you will develop, you, you will long for, see the soul doesn't long for cake. 
it's only the body the tongue in the body not even the body the small part in the body the tongue is what uh, is longing for the cake right so so you have to pay attention uh, so uh, yeah it is just the tongue which is longing and tongue is part of the body it is not part of the soul so desire is a is stemming from the fact that you are thinking that you are the body the body is you but the fact is it, it is not the body but it is the soul which is you so that is the main cause for all these uh, um, bad qualities like anger desire jealousy all those things greed they're all because of considering yourself as the body and not as a soul so the reason we want stuff like cake and um thing junk food is because they're yummy they're for our tongue what about things that we don't like because of pain or discomfort how do we get rid of those because that's a little bit harder than just um, taste yeah the same thing just ignore it so there so i i think i told this many times before also right in one of the previous lokas also uh, <clears throat> there are many people who are suffering from arthritis there are many people who are suffering from uh, back pain back pain and uh, arthritis they don't go away back pain why does why do people get back pain from leaning over huh yeah slouching and all what happens is that the vertebrae the vertebrae in the back they get dis dislocated slightly so when they are dislocated the pain remains so they are never going to come back whatever you do that is one reason the other reason is there are so many reasons for back ache but people are living with chronic back ache chronic arthritis continuous pain uh, they are still living fine why because they are able to ignore the time they are able to ignore but a wise person will ignore right from the beginning because body is not the person so just because there is back pain just because there is arthritis one should not get into depression right depression is something to do with the mind so um, so always separate yourself from the body the root cause of all problems is attaching yourself to the body thinking that the body is you so in the next sloka we are that we are going to cover lord krishna gives you a, a recipe for meditation meditation is uh, a tool which will connect you to the soul and uh, and it helps you get over the feeling of attach attachment to the body when you through meditation you connect to the soul you feel that you are the soul so that way when you are with the soul you automatically detach from the body you cannot be both body and soul right you can be only one right you can be either uh, x or you can be either y you cannot be both x and y right so uh, so meditation connects you to the soul and that's a very good way to detach from the body from all the evils Sorry, what is that? So it's basically a small story that my dad told me. So um, Shiva wanted to test his disciple to to see if he really reached the um, the level of God. So he went to um, Adi Shankar Acharya. and he said who are you and adi shankar acharya said i am not the body nor the mind and i forgot the third one but um oh god sorry uh, what was what is the conclusion he said shiva so, oh shiva okay Like he didn't tell who he actually was, but he told who he actually was by 
by saying who he was not. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so uh, meditation basically uh, helps you get over the attachment. And um, we have a whole lifetime to get over attachments. God has given the whole lifetime from the day we are born to the day we give up the body. We have all the time to ourselves to get over this, this feeling. Right? Like Adi Shankaracharya that Aditi said. Uh, he basically practiced it. Right? He practiced this uh, detachment right from day one. He lived for only 30 years, 31 or 32 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, the, in those 30 years, he contributed so much to the world. We are still, after so many years, we are still um, reciting his uh, words. Right? So we have a whole lifetime. Um, so we, uh, so that means that we don't have to be, we don't have to rush with that. We have to be gentle, and the whole idea of uh, dealing with these kind of animal instincts, the basic instincts, is to be gentle with them. That is what you learn in meditation, anyway. So if you have observed whatever we have been talking in these sessions, uh, in the thirty. This is the 33rd session of Bhagavad Gita and five sessions each of the other Vedic and uh, Sanatana Dharma. Uh, uh, Sanatana Dharma. So 48 sessions in total. Yeah, I don't know how many ever. But all these, if you observe something, what is something that is common among you know, all these things? Is there any common theme that you observe? in whatever we have been talking on these Sundays? Detachment and attaining nirvana or moksha. moksha. Yeah, that is right. That, that is one thing. But even, even subtler than that, there is something very, very common to everything that we talk. So like Vedic math is there. Vedic math, we don't talk about soul and detachment, right? So Vedic math, um, Bhagavad Gita, then uh, Vedic hymns, Vishnu Sahas, Nama. There's something common. Well, everything, like when we talked about the um, 11th Anavaka, um, we learned about all of the not material world things. So everything seems to contribute to the idea that the material world isn't the entire world. Like it's not yeah, yeah, right. You're almost close. So, um, what about math? There's something common to math also. So, all these concepts, including math and science and uh, technology, machine learning, all these concepts, there's something common. And that is that they are not real, they are all abstract. You cannot see them. Can you see multiplication? No. Can you see addition? Can you see, uh, what else did we talk? Um, uh, that the sun is made of helium and uh, hydrogen? Yeah. And uh, uh, how about the soul? Did you see a soul anytime? No, so these are all, yeah, these are all abstract concepts. Soul, attachment, detachment, sannyasa, um, all these are abstract. So <clears throat> a lot of people will not be able to understand these concepts in all their life. You are very fortunate that God has bestowed upon you the environment, the brain, the mind, uh, the culture that helps you understand. But a lot of people uh, cannot understand these things. You try to teach math to somebody, some people. I have taught, I have tried to teach math to some people. They can't understand. Why? They can understand uh, which restaurant uh, uh, 
gives uh, provides the best uh, biryani for instance they they can understand that they can understand uh, most other material uh, things that you feel but they cannot understand math they cannot understand spirituality they cannot understand um, see what is spirituality spirituality means attaching to your spirit spirit is soul right so and you can't see soul the whole idea of spirituality is very abstract so there are many people they don't believe in god many people can't understand the concept of god just like many people can't understand the concept of math many math concept like calculus you talk to them about calculus or what, what do you study in math these days uh, algebra algebra for instance x, x square plus um a x square plus uh, uh, b x y plus uh, c y square right so if, if you talk those things they won't even understand why because it's very abstract what is x what is y well, what do you mean by that they can't make out same thing with soul same thing with uh, all these things people who are gross will not be able to understand these concepts at all so in fact they may even misinterpret it even if they try to understand some people may even misinterpret it um and they start criticizing it i know a few people who started as devout uh, uh, devout uh, people in this uh, sanatana dharma but they started criticizing it they started opposing it because it was hard because their 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 level of uh, uh, abstraction is only limited they are more gross their nature is more gross than abstract so they can they can go only to certain extent beyond that they start questioning so they only believe it if they see it yeah they only believe if they see it in fact some of their criticisms are very nasty so when i was small when i was your age probably a author a popular author uh, wrote uh, she was she started out as a devout uh, she was born in a family which believed in rama lord rama and all that but she wrote a book completely against Ra- ramayana it was called ramayana visha vruksham visha means poison vruksham means uh, huge tree so she wrote ramayana poisonous tree ramayana she compared ramayana to a poisonous tree so people and for it is very unfortunate see they they started they god gave them the right environment the right um, uh, mindset to start with but because of their grossness they could not survive in the abstractness of the uh, of our sanatana dharma they turned against so the moment such things happen in you and sometimes it is a common feeling you you will feel gross they are all human being whenever you feel that you are touching the limits of abstractness think that you are going in the wrong direction sometimes you might tend to when you are angry or when you are disappointed when you are frustrated when you are in depression you might feel what is god what is all this nonsense and that is when you should remember that you are going in the wrong path you are you are being gross you are not no longer being subtle you are no longer being abstract um, so uh, see today many asians most of the phd programs uh, are um, the students in phd programs are asians right Um, most of the uh, people in the stem fields science technology engineering and mathematics fields they are asians they are doing very well in stem fields why because of their cultural heritage they are they are used to these abstract concepts abstractness does not worry them so they are increasingly used to these abstract concepts so they are able to invent abstract concepts as well you see a lot of new papers in machine learning they are all abstract it's very hard to see them so because we are used to those that kind of thinking from our uh, generations ago we are able to do well they are able to understand math easily we are able to understand science easily 
right? And same with uh, uh, Europeans who are good in math and science. You take Einstein, for instance. He was very good and he is the most intellectual. And you saw what he said about Bhagavad Gita, right? Yes. Maybe. So, so they like people who like science, technology, engineering, and math will also like these concepts, the Sanatana Dharma concepts, because they are kind of related. They're, they're both are abstract and abstractness does not worry them, right? So, um, so with that said, let us look at some of the abstractness in machine learning. So machine learning is able to do a lot of stuff, right? So let us see what else it can do. So in the last, uh, last time when we talked about artificial neural networks, right? We talked about something called a perceptron. Perceptron is like a small neuron. It's a mini version of the neuron in the brain, right? If you remember, uh, you remember, right? This is the neuron. This is the, um, this is how a neuron looks like. So it has a nucleus, it has impulses, and it connects, and it to, connects other to other neurons and all that stuff, right? So um, the perceptron is like a small neuron, miniature version of the neuron in the brain. So what it does is it takes inputs. So what are the inputs to the neuron in your brain? Um, like feelings, what we see. Exactly, we hear, right. We the sensory, face. whatever comes to the sensory organs, the skin, the, uh, the eyes, the, uh, the taste and all those things, right? So those are the inputs to the neuron. The signals from those are the neuron, uh, inputs to the neuron. So just like that, um, the perceptron also takes a number of inputs. So they are called input nodes. And then for the, for the signal to go to the next neuron, for the signal to go to the next neuron, the signal has to be strong. Otherwise it will be ignored. So if we do brain does like not, yeah, light. brain does not pay, uh, pay attention. So like uh, air is there, air is touching your fingers. Always. Always. But does your brain act on it? Really, no. Yeah, because the signal strength is so low, it ignores it. It does not even send it to the next neuron. It just ignores it. So a neuron needs to get fired to connect to the next neuron. Fired means it goes to above a level. So it, the energy must, the, the push must be so far, hard that the signal can travel to the next neuron. Until, until that happens, it doesn't do anything. Right? So the same thing in uh, perceptron. So each input is weighed. And even in machine learning, we remember, right? There are weights. So there are weights for each input. Uh, some some uh, inputs carry more weight, some inputs carry less weight. So to start with, we can assume that all the uh, inputs are equally important. The touch is important. The uh, what we see is important. Everything is important. Um, so the weights in this case are 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3. This is just an approximation. So then the inputs and the weights are combined. How do they? How do you combine weights and inputs? Did you cover? Uh, did you come across weighted average in your science classes? Not yet, yeah. right? I think in the eighth grade or ninth grade, you'll come across weighted average. Is it basically when one thing gains a priority over another? No, weighted average means suppose X1, see, look at this table on the left. So X1 is one, X2 is zero, X3 is zero. The weighted average and the weights are 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3. So the weighted average is actually weighted sum. Average is uh, you have to divide it by three because there are three inputs, but we look at weighted sum. But in chemistry, you will probably, chemistry and physics, you will uh, be dealing more with weighted averages, uh, but here it is weighted sum. So what we do is we multiply X1 by the weight. So how much is it? X1 is one times 
0.3. It will be 0 0.3. It will be 0 0.3. How about x2? It's 0, so it will be 0. 0. x3? 0 again. 0. Now you sum all these three up. This sigma, this is called Greek letter sigma. You know that, right? Is it Z? No, it is sigma. The capital letter S in Greek. Oh, like alphabet. So you never did that. Uh, so you can try it actually. Uh, Does it have a mathematical way? See, like you do Microsoft Word. So in Microsoft Word, you can you can try all the Greek letters. See, like this is Microsoft Word, right? So the font is Calibri, right? You change it to symbol. Symbol. Let us do this. Change it to symbol. Now you start, you write S. You get a sigma, capital sigma. You type A, you get alpha. You type B, you type you get beta. Then C is shy. C looks like the algebraic X. Yeah, it is shy. Um, C D D is delta. E is epsilon. Uh, F is phi. F G G is gamma. So you get all the uh, alphabet. And if you want capital letters, type capital G, that is capital gamma. And then capital F, capital phi. So you get all the Greek letters. So the first letter is sigma, capital S in Greek. Would P be pi? Yeah, P is pi. Oh. And capital P helpful. is capital pi. Does capital P have a meaning? Nothing. Yeah, it, in you will encounter capital P multiple times. Capital wow. P, huh? Wow. Yeah, capital P means um, product. In mathematics, so multiplication. multiplication is represented by capital Greek pi. Yeah, we learned and, that. Yeah. And if you want small letter sigma, type S, you get the small letter sigma. That is small sigma. First is capital sigma and the last is small sigma. So what does uh, sigma mean? In... Sigma is S, the letter yeah, like, like, what Summation, is... summation. S for summation, right? Yeah. So, add, so we add the um, inputs, or the, after we put right. the weighted average, then we add those. We add those. So it is 0.3x1 plus 0.3x2 plus 0.3x3. But remember, every system has a bias. You remember that, right? Do you remember bias? So the bias of this system is 0.4. So bias is also like a weight, initial weight. It is a weight when there's nothing there. So there's a bias in the system. So that is 0.4. So that you pass it to the summation. So you give a minus, actually it should be minus 0.4. Uh, the bias is minus 0.4. So you give it as input to the summation node. This is also a node. And what is the job of this node? To it's sum up that. all the inputs it gets. So this line indicates multiplication and this node indicates summation. And then it will give out the output. So this is called the output node. So, so remember that this is the label. Right, these are the inputs features, and this is the label. So, if the features are one zero zero, the label is minus one. Maybe it is false, maybe maybe minus one stands for false, and one stands for true, or um, things like that. Or minus one stands for man, and one stands for woman. Right, so it's it's like two classes, and these are the features. And uh, so this, remember we talked about universal function approximator, this black box is like an approximator. Did we talk about it? No, not yet, right? Okay. 
since black box can generate any kind of input from any kind of output just based on these nodes and we'll see how to do it later but for this small table this works well right you you input the input uh, you you compute the sums for each of those rows you will find that it is true for instance take the first row what is 0.3 times x1 0.3 0.3 times x2 is 0. 0.3 times x3 is 0, right? Which so this is 0. 0.3. So this whole thing is 0. 0.3 minus 0. 0.4 is minus 0. 0.1. Minus 0. 0.1. And what is the sign of that uh, number? Minus. Minus. So if, if sign is minus, then uh, it is minus 1. See, if x is less than 0, it is minus 1. You define like that. If x is greater than or equal to 0, you define it as one. So because it is the sign is minus, it is minus one. And we are correct. See, minus one here. Similarly, take the next one, one, zero, one. So 0 0.3, 0, 0.3, this is 0 0.6, minus 0 0.4, this is 0 0.2. 0 0.2 is plus or minus? Plus. Plus. Or minus. Plus yeah, that one is zero, negative 0.4. Right, then... this is 0 0.2 is a plus, so it will be one. So the, this this column is one, right? Ne take the next one, 0 0.3 plus Two. 0 0.3, same thing, right? Yeah. 0 0.1. And how about the, when all three of them are ones? It will still be greater than 0 0.4, right? So every time the input sums uh, with the weighted sums are greater than 0 0.4, it will be a one. Other times it is minus one. But so, instead of testing, oh, right, never mind. so now the question is, how did you arrive at point three? So we are we were fortunate. We just assumed that these weights are point three, and we we were able to simulate this table very well. But how do you um, come up with these weights? Well, what are we using them for? Like we're obviously just not using it for. So this is a, see, basically this is like a box. This is a box which will take some inputs and produce an output. And what inputs will it take? What output it will produce? This table on the left side. So, so it is like a black box. What happens in the black box is this weighted sum and a sign. Well, we learn about um, tables all the time, like, um, like, like they'll give you an output and an input and an output like a table x and y and they're uh like what they equal and we'll have several pairs and then we need to find out that the equation that makes x equal like the the equation the ratio between x and y right is that the same thing right it is something very similar you are given a bunch of number a table with a bunch of numbers you have to find out the function. You are saying, what did you say? What was the word you used? We have to find the ratio. Ah, ratio, or you use some other generic word. What was the property? Or what did you say? Um, I said that we use a table to find the, the relation. Between the relation. The you said relation, right? But actually, in mathematics, function is a type of relation. So... Um, so this is basically a function. We learned about functions, which are basically we had a table and a function like Can you a, come closer? Okay. a table or an ordered pair is a function. Mm. A table is a fun or sorry, an, an ordered pair is a function if X doesn't have more than one Y out. Right. Right, that is set theory, right? You started studying set theory. Exactly. So you know what a function is. So this black box is basically a function. It takes a bunch of inputs and maps those inputs to outputs. So like in this case, um, one, zero, zero is mapped to minus one. One, zero, one is mapped to one, right? So that is the concept of a function, which comes from relation. Did you also study relations? So you'll, you'll study something called Cartesian product. So when you study all that, you, uh, you will know that the function that you mentioned just now 
is a type of relation. So this is basically a function. So this black box here, it is actually a neural network. Right now it's just a simple perceptron, but uh, in, the, in the long run, it is actually a neural network. It's called a neural network, which is similar in functionality to the uh, neural network in the brain. Uh, it is not exactly say, same or similar, but it, it is inspired by the brain, the function of the brain, right? So, uh, and this black box is also called as a universal function approximator. What does it mean? That means you, so this is basically a function, right? Yeah. A set of input and map to some outputs. So this is like a function. So any kind of function like this, this black box can implement it approximately, not perfectly. There'll be some mistakes. It'll do some mistakes, but it is almost there. So we can do any numbers, not even. Yeah, any numbers. So if it is, uh, two in yeah, suppose this was, zero. so instead of one, zero, one, it was uh, one, uh, one, two, one, and then the output is one. Still, by modifying these, you can still get, uh, uh, you can still build a black box for which this table holds good for most of the table. Isn't the whole black box, including the X and the Y, isn't it just an equation like, um, like, one plus one equals two. Wouldn't one be at the x's, or one would be the x's, then the plus one would be the black box, and then two would be the output. Not yeah, you can express this as a function, an algebraic function, right? How do you express it? Like this: 0.3x1 plus 0.3x2 plus 0.3x3 minus 0.4. This is an algebraic function that is equal to y. So this was very simple case. That's why you are able to represent the function like this. But, but what about complicated things uh, like recognition of uh, an object by the self-driving car? So wh what are the inputs for the self-driving car in that case? To recognize a stop sign, for instance. Um, the pixels? The pixels, right? Each of these inputs will be pixel. And how many pixels are there in, a, in an image? Thousands. thousands, several thousands. So there'll be thousands of inputs. And what is the output? The object. The right. object, whether it's a stop sign or not, right? So all that is implemented in a black box. So how do you do this? It's all based on weight. See, the inputs are fixed. The output is also fixed. What can you change within the black box? What are the things that you can change in the black box so that the inputs get mapped to the output? The, um, the weighted average? The weights. And the Just the weights. Just the weights. The Instead of 0 0.3, so it could be 0 0.1. It could be minus 10. It could be minus 20. Can we change the bias? Yeah, the bias is the other one you can change. Yeah, good, good point. So you can only change the bias and the weights. So the whole idea of neural networks and machine learning, we talked before also, is to basically find the weights and the bias. That's it. And the neural network is such an architecture that given any kind of inputs and any kind of outputs, it is able to come up with the weights needed to generate that output from the input. So just like our brain, right? Just like our brain, it can take any inputs and it can produce any uh, desired outputs that you like, right? If it, is, uh, if it is taste, if it is the cake that you're eating, your inputs are all your uh, tongue, uh, what, what do you call them? Uh, taste buds, right? Uh, the senses, the inputs are all the signals from the taste buds. And what is the output? It's uh, the food they eat. No, the, the, food, the feeling that you get. So it will produce, the, the brain automatically produces uh, those chemicals which will make you happy, right? 
So given any kind of inputs and their corresponding outputs, the brain is able to produce them, right? So just like that, a neural network is able to produce any kind of inputs, uh, I mean, any kind of outputs from a given set of inputs that you desire. And how does it do it? By these weights. Now, for this table, we were fortunate. We just used 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3. We just guessed and we used 0.3s. And then for the bias, we did 0.4 and we were good. We basically came up with this table. But what if there are more complicated problems? So you need to find weights. How do you find the weights? The way you do it is first you assume some weights, whatever it is, just assume some weights. And then do this repeatedly. So for each training example, so for training examples, you know the features and you know the label also, right? So compute the predicted value of the label. So you hide the answers, you hide the labels and compute the label by yourself. Now, if it is correct, then there's no loss. It is all good. But if it is not correct, then you update the weights. So the next round of weights will be the previous weight plus a constant times the change in the labels. So what is predicted is this called hat symbol. It's like a hat, right? Like a hat on the head. So it's like the hat symbol. Hat is for prediction. And this is a iteration. That means the time. Yeah, because it, it has to go back and forth. So it will go like this, compute Y. If it is not correct, it has to go back and correct the weights. Then again, compute the uh, weighted sum, get the output and see if it is okay or not. If it is wrong, then again, keep on looping like this. So each of these loops is called an iteration. We did something like that in technology um, last year where in Python, there was some, there was like a table and like there were words and you had to flip the words. It's, it's a lot simpler. And so you had to code it and it would test each one. And as soon as one failed, then, it would, then you had to change it and then test the whole thing again. Is it? Yeah, something it similar. The same, it, was in the, it was a table as well. Yeah, it is so. something similar. So we keep on iterating, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until the weights are all correct. The weights are good enough to produce this kind of a table. The weights and bias, of course. Bias is considered as a zeroth weight, the initial weight. So it's also a kind of weight. So we go back and forth, back and forth until uh, we, the the entire training set is matched. Because it, it will not be 100% matching, but it depends. For some problems, 90% is good. Some problems, 70% is good, and so on. So we stop the algorithm, the iteration going back and forth once we achieve that particular accuracy. See, it is so abstract, right? Isn't it abstract? And our Sanatana Dharma is also very abstract, right? Idol worship and all that thing, it's, it's abstract yeah so the concept behind uh, idol worship these are all very abstract concepts um, so how do you update the weights you do like this uh, until a stopping condition what is the stopping condition if they're equal the accuracy like yeah if the if you are able to reproduce a table most of the time not entirely but at least most of the time k is the loop number iteration number and lambda is called the learning rate how fast you want to learn is lambda also a constant greek symbol? yeah it's a greek symbol it is for l so if you look at that uh, uh, microsoft word if you type uh, l you get lambda and if you type capital l, you get capital lambda So, so uh, this is quite intuitive, right? So what is happening here? So the, suppose the weight was 0 0.3 and it predicted, uh, it made an incorrect prediction. So lambda was say 0 0.1 or something. 0 0.1 lambda, remember we talked about learning rate before? Yeah. We changed the learning rate and it was jumping all around and all that stuff. Smaller and smaller. Yeah, smaller and smaller. 
So this lambda is the learning rate. So, uh, so suppose the learning rate is 0.1. And, and it made an incorrect prediction. It was 0.3, it made an incorrect prediction. Instead of uh, uh, minus one, it predicted one. So y i is minus one. That is from the training data. The training data had minus one, but this guy incorrectly see like this here, right? So we close these labels. We don't see these labels. We close these labels. At the time of training, what is happening? How do you train yourself? You if it's the answer, answer, yeah, you covered the, the answer, right? Answer. Right. So that is exactly what we are doing. So we cover the answer minus one, and then go through this and try out the predicted output y hat. Now this is actually minus one, but this guy produced one. What is the difference between the two? The predicted and the predicted and the um, actual one. What is the difference? What is the uh, uh, predicted one is just the absolute value of that. So what is the what is the value of y i minus y hat i? What does hat equal? Hat I told you is the predicted value. So suppose instead of minus one, it predicted one. What does this term? How much will this term uh, evaluate to? So yi is how much? Minus, so minus one. Minus one. And why I had is one. one. So minus one minus one is how much? Minus two. Minus two. Good. Lambda is point one. How much is point one multiplied by minus two? Point one, right? Point so, one multiplied by minus two. So minus point two. Minus point two. Exactly. So the weight is decreasing or increasing? Decreasing, right? Because you're subtracting something from the weight, right? Oh, nice. Right. So, so is that correct or wrong? So if, uh, if uh, what is expected is minus one, but your, your black box has produced plus one, that means it has produced more than what is needed. So the weight must decrease or increase. Okay. In this case, it must decrease by two. Yeah, it must decrease, right? So that is the reason why uh, we do y i minus y hat i. So it is quite intuitive, right? If it is producing, and similarly take the other case. Suppose the real answer is uh, one, and what it produced was minus one. Minus one. Then you need to increase by two. Increase by two. And it is correct also, right? Because you want the value of yi to go up, right? Instead of, uh, it predicted minus one, but it should have been one. So that means the weight should go up, right? So this is a nice formula to change the weights, right? You agree? But does it tell you how much you have to change it by? Yeah, this is this is a learning rate, and this is how much you need to change it by. And x one you can take it as one or zero. And if y i is equal to y hat i, that means uh, then it's true. It's uh, yeah, it is working. So the weight will remain the same. This will be this term will be zero, right? So this works, right? So the weight update formula is this one the one that we saw. Of course, we multiplied with the, the feature of also, because the feature has to be incorporated also, so, because it's a weighted sum anyway, right? So the x stands for all three of x's, x1, x2, and x3. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, we update the weight. So if it is the error is 0, no update is made. The weight will remain the same. If the if the y value, the actual value is more than the predicted value, then the error is two, like we talked, right? So the weight must be increased. 
and the other case the weight must be decreasing so if you do that um, so you start with the weight 0 0 0 which is not advised but in this case we are just starting with 0 0 or let us start with minus 2 minus 0 0.2 minus 0 0.2 0 and 0 so what is w0 no, what is W0 in this diagram? Weight? In this diagram, what is W0? X1? No, it is a bias. Remember I told you bias is also like a weight, initial weight. So uh, W0 is like the bias. So now if you continue, if you count, if you apply the formula each time, weight at sum, weight at sum and check. So what is the, if it is minus 0.2, the weight zero is minus 0.2, weight one is minus 0.2, uh, W2 is zero and W3 is zero. So how much would it count to for the first row? The weight, but which weight would we use? Because in the other one, we only have one weight. How would you apply it to multiple weights? You yourself said, you have to, you have to uh, sum up the weight, uh, weights, uh, the features, right? Oh, so so minus 0.2 is the, there's nothing, it's bias. So there's nothing corresponding to the features. So this is a constant, this will remain like that. W1 times X1. So minus 0.2 times one. So minus, minus 0 0.2. And this is zero. So the other two terms are zero basically. So this is minus 0.2 and uh, minus 0.2. So it is minus 0.4 and you're getting minus one. So this is good. So you keep on doing like that. So for, for one round of the entire training set, it is called an epoch. Epoch. Epoch means you do the weighted sums for the entire uh, training set once. So first time, for the entire training set, it is epoch one. Second time, two. Third time, three, and so on and so forth. So if you see, towards, after a few iterations like that, you see that the weights are converging. See, initially it was 0.2, and the weights were not, were quite different. But as you go ahead, if, as you, uh, make more and more iterations, these epochs, you will notice that the weights converge. So in this case, three of the weights are converging. The bias is converging to 0 0.6, minus 0 0.6. The W2 is converging to 0 0.4. W3 is converging to 0 0.2. You know the meaning of converging, right? Yeah. They are becoming same. They are becoming same. So if you, if you repeat a few more times, you might end up in a constant weights. So they'll all be the same? They'll all be the same eventually. I mean, the, the, no, no, what I mean to say is the rows will be the same. The columns will be different. Columns are W0, W1, W2, but the rows is for each epoch, right? So eventually the rows will not change. Oh, so like the values in each row yeah. will stay the same? will stay the same. That's when you stop. So that's how you compute the uh, output. So basically a bunch of inputs, bias term, then a bunch of weights, then uh, you sum them up and uh, uh, you pass them to a active, this is called an activation function. Why is this called an activation function? Is it because activated? if it is, yeah, is because- it because if it is, if the sign is minus, then it's minus one. If it is uh, plus, then it is plus one. So it's like a step function, the activation. So the step function is, is, a, uh, is like an, uh, so the activation function is like a step function. So based on that, you uh, give out the output. So that is the idea of a perceptron. So this was invented by somebody called Frank Rosenblatt in 1957, long back. And today it is coming out, it is so much in uh, use, right? Your self-driving car and so many things depend on this. 
right? So this is the idea of positron. So this is like a small neuron in your brain. This, this works like a neuron. Okay, I think we uh, kind of ran out of time. So let us end our discussion here. So the, the, conclu the concluding takeaway from today's uh, class is that abstract concepts, power, there's power in abstraction. So the more comfortable you are with abstractness, the better your life is. The more gross you are, you attract more gross things, right? So the more subtle, more abstract, that is the reason why research is a noble profession, right? Research and teaching, because you live in abstraction. Right. Okay, let us end uh, the class with our prayer. Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyote Gamaya Nityamaya Amrutam Gamaya Om Shanti Shanti See you next class.